I don't recall ever a time in my career that we've had this significance of a wake-up call. So, you know, it gives us the chance then to say, is what we're doing working? You know, should we do things differently? Can we do things better but more efficiently? And I think the answer to that in many ways is yes, yes, and yes. To me, it's a really exciting time for us to use the information and knowledge that we have to carve out what the future is. If, you know, if we choose as a profession to do the same old, same old, then expect the same, you know, insanity results. Let's look to these companies and what they're providing for us so that when we do make our instrument selection in order to treat the disease, at least we should know what disease are we treating because that will guide what we do. Get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast guy genist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Tale of Two Hygienist, episode number 253. My name is Andrew. And this is Michelle. Welcome. And if you're not familiar with this podcast, we do a little chit chat and then we'll get to the interview. It's a good one. So I know you want to get to it. I'm going to say Michelle is back, everybody. I'll just, <laughs> right before I got on to record this, and I, I knew you're back. So I've seen some of your social media posts recently. But there was just yet another epic argument that Michelle's taking part of on social media. So welcome back, Michelle. Shocker. Yeah, I did. I took a hiatus. I, I mean, if, if you've listened to this podcast, if you've ever met me, like, you know, I feel my feelings vocally and intensely. <laughs> Other people feel her feelings when she's feeling her feelings. Let's just put it that way. Yes. Everyone's going to know it, but I, I try to be authentic. I try, I try to make sure you always know where I'm at. <laughs> Yeah. And as much as I don't love to walk a statement back, I will, though. Oh, you've walked many a statement back in our time, I would say. You're I, very good about I mean, it. I'm, when you, I, I don't love it. It sucks. It hurts my soul. But if you're wrong, sometimes. then you're not. But if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Or just uninformed and not really realizing it and dealing with some biases that I wasn't aware of. And I have grown. I love to walk those statements back. But yeah. 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 So, yeah, I took a, a little hiatus from the social media because um, I just was at a place where I was not going to be able to work with some people professionally again because I don't have the ability to silo a lot of things. So that's uh, that was what I was doing. But, yep, I'm back feeling like a, a new person, but I am going to probably take everything off of my phone. What does that mean? Like, all I'm not going to be on social media, like on my phone. Oh, you mean you'll just be on a desktop and yeah. not be. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. I mean, I just feel like it's, you know, I read a book called Indistractable um, many months ago and I definitely took down. And again, we'll get to dental hygiene, y'all. This is the chit chat part before the great interview that I was talking about earlier. But this um, book helped me, I guess, get rid of all like the lottery notifications and just really talked about like the how our brains get super distracted and, you know, multitasking really, even though I'm currently multitasking while I podcast and I curl my hair at the same time. Yes, you are. Yeah. <laughs> it's like not always super such a great idea. So I had taken notifications off like my email doesn't ding me. I mean, text message and phone calls. Yes. But, you know, Slack notifications, email, anything that vibrates my phone in any way that would make me stop what I'm doing and pick it up because that's how our brains work, that instant gratification, dopamine release. And I just, so I'm taking it all off and, you know, trying to live a simpler life without all of um, the things that I read that are super frustrating. <laughs> No, I would love to have some updates here in a few weeks and see how that actually goes. Because I, I know lots of people have tried that before and they can't do it. And by the way, kudos to you for reading a book, which is also something people don't do hardly anymore, myself included. I'm actually reading right now The Checklist Manifesto and I have about three books sitting on my coffee table that are waiting in queue. And 
Well, because after a lot of, well, after quarantine and then definitely after the uh, George Floyd situation, I st- I joined a book club called the Historically Accurate Anti-Racist Book Club. And so I have a book a month that I read. Some of them are very heavy and very hard to read, but needed life lessons for sure. So I've been reading a lot lately. Good for you. Look at that self-improvement. I love it. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, buddy. Another thing on on the dental hygiene side, you know, I'll think I, I I love to bring up things that we talked about probably four years ago. Uh, yeah. um, Whether it's on the podcast or when it's in our personal life, you do love to bring those things up. Fantastic! <laughs> I can't wait to see what this is going to be about. There's things that like you know sit in my head and I ponder and I'm like, am I wrong? Could I grow on this? Why were they thinking it this way? Why is it this way just as a generalization? I don't know, whatever it is, right? So this particular thing that's been not on my mind forever, but I think I came to a conclusion as to why I'm kind of uh, baffled by your comment to me, because I think I, as per usual, am the anomaly. So many years ago, I was like, I'm shocked that nobody's probing after me. Like, I think doctors should probe after hygienists. And you were like, yeah, you gave me that face there. Yeah. And it's a face of disgust, everybody. That's what's. And but not for like check on me, but because two sets of eyes are always better, like two sets of, you know, people looking at it. And for calibration reasons, I think that there should be that. And then I see that I have always worked in perio. So my very first office, I had to send all those probing depths to the referring offices. I had to then take it up to the the upstairs office because they would write these huge letters post-surgery. So everything had to be documented and documented well. And so we, if I was like, hey, I'm worried about five, six and uh, seven millimeter pockets in the posterior here, like they checked it, we validated it, we came up with a treatment plan and said, you know, I don't, so I always had somebody there looking at my notes, looking at my probing depths. And then in my last office um, that I left, that I was full time in, I mean, she was a micromanager, like homegirl was like spell checking and like putting commas in places. I was like, these are damn chart notes. If I didn't put the comma in one spot, I think it still reads calculus present, <laughs> like, right, right, right. calm down. But she checked it. You know, we always had somebody checking probing depths. I always, you know, it was just so consistently my like norm since the day I graduated. All of this to say now that I'm temping and I'm in these offices as like one time or just a few times, I am baffled by why people aren't checking my notes. Like, you don't know me. I know me. I know I'm going to write like a, a damn Bible about this person's situation. But like in six months when they come back, how, how are you making sure that I'm documenting everything for your patient and your practice that you have liability over and no one's checking? I just, it, it, I find it really interesting. And I get that, that I see that that's the norm. So I was like the weirdo there, but it still doesn't make sense to me, but I get why I was upset. <laughs> So, I mean, do you, should we rehash some of the, my thoughts now that it's been years later on that? Yes, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's talk. So I now understand a little bit more of what you're talking about, but I feel still very strongly about just kind of the wasted time and effort of qualified clinicians to do their job. I think that that's more of the, the angle I was coming from. I think the angle that I'm understanding more about you. No, I get it because it could be as a very demeaning it's super demeaning. I get it. It could be seen as that if it's done, it's taken that way or done. Right. But only in a certain way. So like the way you're explaining it, you're saying, Hey, we are a team coming up with a team diagnosis. I want to make sure that everything is right. Similarly, if a dentist said, Hey, if you see any fractures, would you please let me know so that we can work together to diagnose and treat and plan the appropriate treatment for that? Totally get that. In that case, I'm fine with it. Also, temping, like if you are temping and the doctor doesn't know you and does want to come and check in a few spots here and there of maybe radiographically, there's something that they need to investigate that maybe wasn't showing up on your perio chart or vice versa, that there was like, you know, something clinical that they were seeing that didn't show up on and they just want to check a couple of areas. Totally get it. Right. But I think the thing is like one person can do it. 
who are both qualified, dentists, hygienists, they saw one person take charge and run with it. But what was happening to me, I think the reason why I was getting like frustrated was because I recorded nine and the doctor's like, well, it's really kind of a nine and a half. Let's round up to 10. I'm like, okay. Yeah, no, I get that. I'm so like, I'm like, oh, but I like, out. I like where you're coming. I, I, I think I see it better from where you were coming from is like the team. This is a, a human being that we need to be taking care of. And you can never have too many eyes on a situation. But remember also for me, perio was never really <laughs> yeah. important. I mean, it was, but it wasn't like my lifestyle, you know? So it was like, it was like, hmm, this is an interesting thing. But anyway. No, I just think I have a little bit more insight to the idea or, or what I was getting frustrated with and just very curious as to why more people aren't doing that. But and I don't want to mitigate that there are people out there who are fighting the micromanagers, fighting the docs. They're like, oh, is not really an eight and a half? And then yours, you called it a, like, right. take a seat, buddy. Right. Step out. I got this. All right. Eight, nine, ten. At this point, are we really splitting hairs? Like, let's, let's come up with a freaking treatment plan. You know, and I do want to bring somebody on the podcast to talk about uh, chart notes. Be good. I just, I, I'm just amazed that I am a temp and I think everybody who hires me and wants me to come into their office appreciates that I want to bring, I want to do the best. Like they're always so appreciative. They're so thankful. They love the information I'm sharing with their patients. So they probably have a trust that I'm going to do the right thing. But also I am hustling between patients because I can't seem, because an hour is not enough time for me. And let's be very right, honest. Like right. I'm having big, big conversations with people and trying to hand scale and polish. And you know, I don't love those light that love that life. So I'm hustling, I'm running behind. I'm going to forget. Like, I, you know, I'm just, so I would love for somebody at the end of the day, be like, Michelle, you missed the chart this morning. I'm like, thank you so much. <laughs> and I think we've just gotten into this, um, the culture of shaming people and embarrassing them versus lifting them up, holding them accountable. And because even an assistant the other day was like, did you uh, start that ultrasonic when you put your instruments? Because I had thrown them in there and then like grabbed something else and was like bagging it up and just didn't even turn it on. I was like, oh, nope, I didn't. Because I didn't mean to say that and like to be snarky. I was like, that was an obvious thing that you needed to say. Like <laughs> I put my instruments in there and didn't start it. The in part of that would be somebody taking them out and they hadn't gotten run. Like that, that is an absolute place for you to hold me accountable. It, I did not feel like it was in a demeaning, shaming way, but I just think we've gotten, and I don't, I also don't want to say this, like we've gotten sensitive because I think some people are whole, they're being cruel with that. Like, Oh, you're just so sensitive and you're offended by everything. I'm like, well, you said some rude stuff. So yeah, I'm a little offended, but we aren't coming from a place of being kind with how we say it and also open that it needed to be said. <laughs> right, right. It's definitely double-edged on that one. I would, I look forward to that podcast. So if we can find someone that has, that can talk about chart notes for extensively, or maybe, you know, put it together as part of a uh, round table yes. or something. I have somebody in mind because the universe uh, said, oh, you probably should have somebody on as I was thinking about it. And Dwayne Tinker from Talking with a Tooth Cop had a podcast about chart writing. And I was like, so I texted him. I was like, oh, hey, buddy, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to need you to bring that content on over here. OK, yeah, yeah. So he, I think uh, we're going to have that. So if you guys have any questions, let me know. So along the same lines, we are working on doing like a, this little retreat this weekend coming up in like two or three days from whenever this releases. And so we need, if you guys are listening to this, like the day that it releases, will you please reach out to us and let us know what you guys want to hear about? So chart notes is going to be something coming up. What are you looking at me all weird for? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, don't know. okay. Just a regular weird one. So if you guys just have a, just a normal is, weird look, if you guys have something you want to listen to, or there's an expert you want to hear more on, uh, let us know because we are compiling 2021 this weekend. So please, please, please reach out. And also, if you like the very specific things about this podcast, you don't like specific things. And if you're like, I don't like y'all's intro, that probably isn't going to change because I like to talk and have these venting sessions. So I've tried to get her to shut up for years, you guys. Yeah, it's and just it's not going to happen. It doesn't happen. I mean, I started a podcast for a reason. Yeah, to talk a lot. <laughs> 
a lot. But if you have something that you want to hear, you like, I don't know if you were like originally a listener and you were like, hey, I miss scaling the web with Andrew. Remember those days? No, I don't want to rem remember or relive those days. <laughs> oh, come on now. But if you love them, like I will three, make Andrew do that. Three individual segments that we ever put out and that didn't work out very well. Oh, it was so time consuming. Yeah. But anyhow, yeah, I agree. Thank you for any feedback that you will be sending to us. Um, if you go to our Instagram page, there's a link in our bio. Uh, it, you can go to our website. Just send us uh, some kind of communication on um, the contact form. I don't know. You'll find a way. A tale to hygienist.com and a tale to hygienist on all social media. All right, Andrew, I have a really good interview today with Noel Paschke, I cannot believe I am I, like that. We are just now having this wonderful human on. I've been very lucky to know her for a few years. Her and her husband are my relationship goals. They're just out there like doing dental, like Friday night, glass of wine. Let's test some ultrasonics, like <laughs> <laughs> dental goals, <laughs> relationship goals. So I think you guys are really going to enjoy this fantastic conversation and all the things that Noel had to share with us. So enjoy this episode with Noel Paschke. Hey, Michelle. Yeah. It's time for the interview. Oh, but I had something else to say. We need to let the experts talk now. Fine. So welcome to the interview portion of the podcast. I'm very excited to have the one and only Noel Paschke on the podcast and somebody that I've been lucky enough to know for the last few years. And somehow this is the first time I've had you on. I am so sorry, but welcome and thank you for joining me today. Well, I am absolutely thrilled, Michelle. It's been just so wonderful to watch your career and watch everything grow and everything that you've been doing. So it really is an honor for me to be on this podcast and it seems like it's a pretty timely topic right now uh, in the midst of the landscape that we're in. So thank you so much for the invitation. Yeah, well, thank you very much for the kind words. And the topic that we're going to talk about is kind of the state of dental hygiene and with some instrumentation and a, a smorgasbord of stuff that all are relevant things that we need to be, well, we should have had for a while now, but even more timely. So tell us a little bit about your career and what you've been doing. I have had the most incredible dental hygiene career. I mean, just really, really blessed over several decades. And you know, one of the mantras that I live by is um, a phrase that I say, what if? And it really is born out of curiosity. And it's not why not, because the neuro linguistics there tells me that that's more of a negative thing and I want to go in the positive direction. So what if? So it really, my career started, uh, I was in a private practice for just a few weeks after graduation. But uh, prior to that, uh, as a senior in dental hygiene school at the University of Maryland, we did a hospital rotation. And I often say that the hospital bug bit me. I absolutely loved it. And uh, the only problem was there weren't any positions available. So my brain said, what if I created a position and just started making a list of hospitals in Baltimore. And uh, just so happens that one of the world famous hospitals, Johns Hopkins is in Baltimore. And I approached the oral surgery chair and uh, told him all the numerous reasons why he needed to hire a dental hygienist. And he said, absolutely not. And again, not taking no for an answer, my parting comment to him was, when you change your mind, would you promise that you will call me first? And he did. So he called me six weeks later and he wanted me to start the next day. And I explained that that was not possible, that I needed to give two weeks notice to my current employer. And then I would, I would be there. So I started at the same pay scale as the cafeteria workers. And by the time I left the, um, the hospital uh, to go into other adventures, um, I had been appointed to the medical school faculty. It was an awesome job. They had just opened the bone marrow transplant center. At the time, there were two in the country, uh, one at University of Washington and then one at Johns Hopkins. And um, so, you know, we, we didn't have language at the time to talk about oral systemic link. But um, so this was 1977. Um, so we did know that there was a connection but not to any degree that we know the information that we have today. So the observation was that um, patients who had poor oral health, when they were totally immunosuppressed, they spiked fevers and they were dying. So this was, you know, this was a, a real deal. So it was a matter of seeing these 
patients prior to their total immunosuppression, trying to get them into health, and then also trying to keep them in health was, was a real challenge because there wasn't a lot of research at the time. I have to say that my only regret is that I did not, I was not involved in research when I was in that position because it was just, I mean, it would have been a gold mine to do so, but we were so busy treating patients that we didn't devote any time to the research portion, which was terribly unfortunate. But um, having a conversation with the head of the oncology department, uh, he called me over and he said, I you know, we have a patient, they, they have a fever, they're, you know, they, they absolutely look, they're a mess. And he handed me a water pick, which I am a total uh, water floss advocate was then and now. And he said, I want you to go, you know, clean up their mouth. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I've already taken a look at their hematology report today. And, uh, you know, their white count is way too low. I'm afraid if I do that, they will spike a fever um, more so and uh, potentially die. I said, you know, preferably before they're immunosuppressed, I would like to see your patients take care of them. I said, I will come every day at bedside. I will take care of them every single day and brush their teeth personally. And he said, you can't do that. And I said, well, why not? And he said, well, because their gums will bleed when you brush them. I said, well, why do you think that? And he said, well, when I brush my teeth, my gums bleed. I said, well, I would be happy to see you in the clinic as well. <laughs> You know, so it, there were some pi definitely pioneering work there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that was that was out of the gate. And, you know, I look back and I'm thinking, wow, you know, I was 22 years old and just it was just an amazing position. But uh, from there, uh, transitioned into a really incredible perio practice. Then also from there, I uh, had a time where I taught at the University of Maryland Dental School and then made a transition into corporate dentistry having worked for Densply for several years, uh, started that education department, the clinical educators there. Then from there, Phillips uh, had a team of educators there as well. Uh, and then most recently uh, for Acteon. So three international companies, all three very different, very different cultures. You know, one an American company, one a Dutch company, and one a French company. So uh, just really fantastic experiences all the way through my career. And uh, so now that brings me to today. And just this past January, I started my company called Ultrasonics Plus. And the purpose, really what I'm looking for is to create clarity and create confidence and clinical excellence in the area of ultrasonics. So we were off to a really great running start at the beginning of the year. And I have to say that, you know, like, for everyone else, COVID has changed the environment and uh, with that change of landscape, how things are being conducted. So, you know, they had been live in school. One of my favorite things to do is to is to uh, work with faculty and having them transition. And, and actually, it's not so much of a transition, but just to understand the differences in ultrasonic technologies and how to apply them. So it's um, it's been really cool. I get to work with my husband, who's an ultrasonic engineer. He invents and then I teach. We've we've dubbed the name that we're Mr. and Mrs. Ultrasonics, and we actually have an ultrasonic lab here in our house. So uh, sometimes date night is you know going to the uh, doing ultrasonics. <laughs> Listen, that, that's relationship goals for me. I'm like, <laughs> how do I? I want to do dental nerd stuff for this, like a date night, drinking wine. Well, I'll tell you what, come over, come visit, come visit us in Missoula, Montana. You are welcome anytime. Well, all of my favorites are in Missoula, Montana. So my goodness, What's with what that? an honor. I know. <laughs> I mean, who knew? Who knew that Missoula, Montana is like this dental mecca? That It really is. <laughs> so many fabulous people oh. there and fabulous companies oh. as well. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, you've been a real pioneer in the dental industry, and I would love to Hear your thoughts on the state of dental hygiene currently. So we are really at an awesome time. Okay. That's the opposite of what normally people think. We are because, you know, I think in, when we're in situations of um, that we're in right now, like this, this current, what I refer to as landscape that we're in, it gives us a moment to pause and to think about the next steps. And I don't recall ever a time in my career that we've had this significance of a wake up call. So, you know, it gives us a chance then to say, is what we're doing working? You know, should we do things differently? Can we do things better, but more efficiently? And I think the answer to that in many ways is yes, yes, and yes. So that's what I look at. I'm not trying to be, you know, Pollyanna and just like, oh, you know, 
it's all sunshine and roses because it's not. This is a really, really hard time, but it also gives us the opportunity to put the puzzle pieces back together, get off of that that treadmill of just doing the same old, you know, day in, day out, and really thinking it through. They're the things that excite me and that the things that I look for for dental hygienists, that those moments of discernment, not to just do something because it's a tradition and that it's something you should do. I mean, looking at sequencing of the appointment, you know, why is it that for years we've left our health education portion of the appointment to the very end if you had time? When in fact, you know, that should be the first thing we do after our assessment, after a diagnosis is made, then for us to do the behavior modification part before we do any professional instrumentation or interventions on our part. The other thing that I think it brings us to is our really our roots of dental hygiene being preventive specialists and not only preventive specialists, but early intervention specialists. Again, never been a better time to do that. I mean, so there are a couple of things that are the puzzle pieces are all coming together at the same time. So you have this pandemic going on. But, you know, you take a look at the AAP and they just, you know, the last time they updated the AAP periodontal guidelines, that was 1999. So now they were um, updated 2018. And so taking a look at that, it really should jostle us to realize that we are in the medical field and our specialty is located in the oral cavity, the head and neck area. But we are really medical professionals. You know, for years and years, we've been talking about this oral systemic link. And I just think we've been skating along on it. And I think, again, COVID has given us that jostle to say, wait a minute, let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at what we have available to us. Let's take a look at our profession, you know, and making a choice. Am I going to be a profi princess or am I going to be a medical professional that specializes in prevention and early intervention? So, you know, like one of the terms I really, really liked in the AAP guidelines when they talk about incipient gingivitis. So, you know, we know about incipient caries and we know there are all kinds of interventions for incipient caries. But, you know, we start to think about, you know, is a prophy a prophy a prophy? And the answer to that is no, it's not. But when you take a look at those guidelines, really what they're looking at is periodontitis, so a jawbone infection, an osteomyelitis in the bone around the teeth. And, you know, they do mention this incipient gingivitis. I think hopefully the next step will be in the staging and the grading. Um, it wouldn't start with one. It would start with grade uh, stage zero. And in that stage zero, that's where the, the various gingivitis, having the incipient gingivitis live, and then then go to the moderate to severe gingivitis. Then, you know, and, and then when you take a look at the same time, looking at what the um, ADA and the Code Maintenance Committee has done with CDT codes, you know, so having the inception of the D4346. But a lot of people are still confused about, well, what does that really mean? And when do I use that? And they get so sucked in down the tunnel of, well, what's it going to pay? You know, it's not about the payment. It's about documenting the procedure that you provided. To me, it's a really exciting time for us to use the information and knowledge that we have to carve out what the future is. If, you know, if we choose as a profession to do the same old, same old, then expect the same, you know, insanity results. Exactly. This is so uh, apropos to what I just experienced this morning, which was having a conversation with the mobile clinic. And they were saying in the past, they've had such a hard, hard time to find people to come out there and serve the population. And there were so many of these I don't know. I feel like sometimes dentistry just loves to chase its tail. Like it's like we're just chasing that disease and we can't seem to slow down to stop and break that model. And so there were these practitioners coming out there saying like, well, their high blood pressure is too high. I can't do anything today. I was like, well, you could do something today. Could we just have education? Could we Absolutely. do a toothbrushing? Could we disclose? And also 14 feet away from me is a nurse practitioner that specializes in cardiovascular issues. So like, could we start really thinking outside of the box instead of just dismissing people and, and doing true prevention? Like our name of the game isn't extractions. The name of the game isn't composites and restorative work. And yes, all are needed, but that's not the name of the game. And if we're going to tout that we are preventionist, then we really need to get on that prevention like journey 
And then one of them called glass ionomer procedures savage. Really? Yes. I was like, oh, hmm. God bless. I might, I, I might, I might need more information on that. Well, I was like, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, like, as if what? the disease being left in their mouth wasn't savage. Like that wasn't a savage way of treating people. And I think it was just a dated way of looking at a procedure that quote unquote for many years was temporary. And I'm like, no, like we've come so far and the research is there. Like we need to really start kind of getting out of our own way. And there are some really, there's some really great new products, restorative products that are available that as far as restorative re remin type products, I mean, that's the thing is I just, and this is, we're at a point where I think we need to really congratulate the companies that are being very forward focused. You know, like the area that really excites me is with artificial intelligence. I mean, when you think about the possibility of incorporating into your software platform that it could take your radiographs, now assuming that you've got diagnostic quality digital images, but you take those, that software then looks at those images and can tell you, is this a gum infection patient or is this a bone infection patient? Because that's going to determine what instruments you use, that's going to determine your treatment plan, it's going to determine a lot of things. And, you know, that is exciting. It's like, cause I wonder, it's like, you know, we've, there are lots of things that aren't new news. I mean, so like this whole aerosol thing and the aerosols in dentistry, you know, when I look back at some of the earlier research, the primary research and the secondary research, but going back to the primary research, we're looking at 1969. We're looking at 1971. We're looking at 1978. So this is not that's not new news, but so I think again, this um, the pandemic has given us a cause to pause and say, hmm, let's 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 think this through because it's a golden opportunity to be a game changer. And let's hope that we get we see the needle move in that way because it has been a concern that we should have paid more attention to. But very similar, like I know this has been made many times a comparison, but it's very similar to what Hep B and HIV did for us in the late 80s, early 90s, where now we have a bloodborne pathogen standard. And now yes. we're going to have to really look at the fact that we do have transmission based precautions and we do have airborne precautions and droplet precautions. Being the highest producers of aerosols uh, out of most medical or healthcare professions, like it is really time for us to uh, step into our responsibilities to protect ourselves and our patients and our team members, because we're not going to stop, right? Like, we're, I'm not going to put my ultrasonic down. I'm not going to put my air powder procedure um, away. Like, I feel like those are very good and very therapeutic for my patients. And that's, I want to properly diagnose and properly treat them. Exactly. And, you know, we've had a standard of dental hygiene clinical practice, again, for years. And, you know, one of the observations that I was able to make working for international companies and, and just being in different environments, um, different countries and things like that, you know, I just look in North America and the difference between how Canadian hygienists think and how American hygienists think. I don't, you know, I keep going back to why is there a difference? But here's my observation is that the Canadian hygienist, and perhaps it's so embedded into their educational institutions that it's part of their nomenclature, their lexicon, their way of speaking, that they talk about the process of care and where they are in the process of care. Where I find with um, American hygienists, we tend to be, we, we just jump right in and start scaling. And it's like, well, wait, <laughs> what are we trying to do? Right. And so that's why I really love these new AAP guidelines. And I'll tell you, there have been a number of excellent presentations on the guidelines. I just heard one last week. PNG has um, dentalcare.com. And Marianne Dreyer did one of the best presentations. If, um, if the listeners have not been able to listen to that yet, it is worth your hour time to listen to it because she just breaks it down so well that it's just really incredibly well done. And so having that, that diagnosis, but even if we do things like like just thinking about it in terms of are we treating a gum only infection or preventing that and treating that or are we treating something that's more extensive more severe has other modifying factors mitigating factors and is it a bone infection i mean that in itself should tell us and guide us in what we're doing i mean you know sometimes michelle in some of my lectures i'll say can you imagine that, um, and I'll use myself as the patient, and I'll say, you know, and I'm scheduled to have a, a procedure done, and the, I really trust the doctor that, that's doing the procedure, 
And then the doctor says, oh, no, I just wanted to let you know that the instrument that I'm using, it's worn by two millimeters. So is it okay <laughs> if we go ahead and do the procedure? Yeah. Now, in the medical situation, none of us would say, yeah, sign me up. Sure, go ahead and use that doll worn instrument on me. But yet somehow we get into the habit of doing that. So that's also another another pet peeve for me, whether it's hand instruments or ultrasonic instruments. And but I think again, we need to pause and say, what's you know, what's going on? But here's the great news. Again, we've got companies that have really stepped up the game as far as having either instrument subscription services, sharpening services, third party sharpeners or the original manufacturers of the instruments have sharpening services. Uh, you know, American Eagle had introduced us to sharpen free. Um, LM has um, sharp diamond that's on the market now. And so, and then Hugh Freedy just recently released their new Harmony instrument based on the research that they've done with pinch force um, issues. And so it's, you know, I think again, let's look to these companies and what they're providing for us so that when we do make our instrument selection in order to treat the disease, at least we should know what disease are we treating because that will guide what we do. Ah, so true, so true. I just want to let the Princess Profi people just think it, think it through. I want you to be the medical professionals that you are, the prevention specialist that you are, the early intervention specialist that you are, because uh, the, the, the Profi Princess days, I think, are numbered. You know, I have a problem. I struggle. If you've listened to this podcast at all, ever, you know that I probably struggle with people who don't strive to do the best type of care. Like I have very high expectations for myself and for my colleagues and for my patients and for just people in general. And that's my problem. Like I got to realize that not everybody's going to reach my expectations. But when you are, you went into a profession and okay, maybe it wasn't told to you and presented in this way that you were going to be important in the overall health of a human being. And you just saw it as I clock in, I clock out, I go to school for two years, I make a decent hourly salary, I am going to go home and have the the family life and all of that. Like, I get it if that wasn't presented to you. And now to be told, like, you need to step it up, that it, it would be a hard pill to swallow. I understand that. However, if you are not going to sign up to this role of being a healthcare provider, you got to step out. I just, that's my strong opinion. You got to go because it's not going to help our profession. It's not going to help a patient. And then ultimately you're just going to get frustrated as we do transition into better, bigger, more definitive ways of maintaining people. And it might be outside of your, like, um, I pick up a scaler, I scale, I polish, they get the heck out of my chair. I go home at night. Like, you know, but, you know, sometimes I think we need to look in the mirror at ourselves because I think that and I, I certainly recall this very early on in my career is that you know, when people spoke about dental hygiene as quote unquote, a job or a career trying to distinguish the two, one of the first things they would say is, oh, it's really great. You know, you just have to work a couple of days a week and you make really good money. And it's like, what did I hear about patient care? What did I hear about? You know, so I think that we. We need to put on the the big girl panties and the big boy boxer shorts and realize that, that, you know, when someone says, what do you do? My response, it's not that I'm a dental hygienist. My response is I'm a healthcare provider. And they're like, oh, are you a nurse? I said, no, I'm a dental hygienist. And I, I specialize in prevention and early intervention, non-surgical intervention. And they're like, really? I said, yes. And I said, yeah. I said, it's a great profession. I said, uh, you know, I said, in fact, I said, a lot of a lot of the things that we see in the oral cavity, I said, can signal other issues that are going on with the rest of your body. I said, because after all, we know, do know it, it is all connected, right? And they're like, oh, yeah. So it's just more than like making teeth like like white and pretty and shiny. And it's like, absolutely. I said, that's one of the fun jobs. It's one, one of the fun parts of it. It's not the only part though. No. And, you know, so, you know, I think we have to start with ourselves and how we think about ourselves, how we think about our own profession and the internalization of that. Because again, we I go back to the, the Profi Princess. If that's what is what you think is dental hygiene is about, I would say no. And I think what you're saying, Michelle, is like that may be an invitation, exit stage, right? 
and there might be something else out there for you. I mean, you know, just just last week, just looking at um, the American Dental Education Association, I believe it was last week, just recently, uh, looking at uh, the identification of dentistry's role in providing uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. And who would be doing that and writing a letter saying that not only dentists, but identifying dental hygienists, identifying our qualifications. I mean, this is a whole new ball game for us. This is not a pick and polish. This is being a healthcare provider. And I was just so happy to see that the American Dental Hygienist Association were one of the organizations that signed that letter. You know, so it was really, I thought, okay, this is good. This is very good. And this is, you know, our place in where we fit in the healthcare delivery team. Gosh, yes. Say it louder for the people in the back. Like it is, it is time to step into that role and, and know that I don't say that without the idea that there's going to be pushback. There's going to be pushback from employees, other employees, your employers, from patients that were used to like the polishing. I am not experiencing any of that at all. I, I think it's because I approach it of like a list. If, if you've got a question, let's talk about it. Or maybe people are just scared of me. I don't know, but they don't. I don't think they're scared of you. <laughs> but my patients. Everybody don't loves you. Them. Well, thank you. But my, my patients, I think, really enjoy that. I'm like, hey, I got something new that's happening in the world of dental hygiene, and I'm going to flip your appointment, and let's get excited about it because yeah. I think this is a better way of taking care of you, and I think you're going to enjoy it more. And they're always like, what? Tell me what? What are you talking about? They're so excited to learn. But I think it is a change and we we are creatures of habit too, I think, you know, um, and we want, we're very into our routine and our rhythms. And when we start disrupting that, it gets a little awkward and icky, but without the ickiness, you don't always find growth. So we have to embrace it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't have the ultrasonic plus expert, Mr. the, the miss of the Mr. and Mrs. Ultrasonics. <laughs> on the podcast and didn't talk about instrumentation and ultrasonic use. Let's dive into that. Well, I am so excited about this because this is where I have to say, this is where my geekiness really shines through. And I have loved ultrasonics for a really, really long time. And uh, when I was teaching at the University of Maryland, one of our favorite things in the entire year was at the end of the semester, spring semester, the seniors used to always have a banquet. And at the banquet, they used to roast the instructors which was absolutely hysterical to find out what they really thought about us. And so one year, one of the students made me a crown and, and, and gave it to me, and it was for being the Cavatron queen. And it was a <laughs> crown that had a purple boa and a insert, a magneto insert um, on the top of it. So, you know, it was just a, a really fun thing to do. But I've been in love with ultrasonics for a really, really long time. So I'm excited to share some things with you in, in particular related to the current environment that we're in related to aerosol generation from ultrasonic therapy and respiratory disease transmission. So I'm, I really am very passionate about this. And I hope that for the listeners that there'll be a few pearls that they'll consider and say, hmm, you know, this is something that I should think about, perhaps make some modifications and uh, and take it from there. And what I call uh, knowledge, skill, and judgment. So using their knowledge, using their skill, but the most important component, of course, is using their judgment of when to, when not to, and taking all the factors into consideration. So Michelle, one of the things that I find that um, as I look at the profession of dental hygiene is that over the years, we tend to practice out of tradition. And I think it's time to shake that up a little bit. And I think that we really absolutely must do first things first, and that's a diagnosis. And that having a diagnosis is absolutely essential and that we're not treating the appointment book. We are treating a complex person. And we've got to consider that person's condition, their likelihood of recovering from their dental disease, which is be a prognosis, and as well as risk for future disease. And in many ways, that sounds medical, doesn't it? Oh, very much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. it is. It is because we're healthcare providers. And fortunately, the AAP in 2018 published the proceedings from the 2017 workshop related to staging and grading. So that gives us a great framework to use. And in particular, they were looking at the extent and severity of clinical attachment loss. So recession, pocket depths, radiographic bone loss. 
And that is what will dictate the root surface anatomy that's available for us to instrument. So the more clinical attachment loss, the more complexity in the root anatomy with concavities, infurcations, et cetera. We have had prior to that in 2016, a revised version of the standards of clinical dental hygiene practice. So that documents the process of care, meaning that first we do an assessment, a diagnosis, a plan, and then the implementation followed by evaluation and documentation. And many times I think we operate at such warp speed, we just jump into that implementation phase without considering the assessment, the diagnosis, and the plan. And then, you know, we do this implementation part and many times we don't do the evaluation part of did the therapy that we provide actually work? Mm -hmm. Is the patient getting healthier? So those two, I think, are keystone documents for us with the AAP in collaboration with the European Federation of Periodontology. With that document on staging and grading and then the standards of clinical practice really should be dictating what instruments we're using. So when we get, we talk about ultrasonic therapy, what we're looking at is that it has two components and it deals with frequency and amplitude. And someone might say, who cares? Well, I want to give you the who cares and the why behind it. So the frequency is just the number of times that the tip is moving. So if, 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 if you have the unit and it's, they say 30K, it's 30,000 times per second. And so uh, the amplitude though, that's where is, that's the sweet spot that we can adjust that's going to impact our aerosol production. So you can't change the number of times, on auto-tune units anyway, you're not changing the number of times it's moving, but you are changing the distance or the whipping motion of that, of that tip. So we've got two ultrasonic technologies, magneto, magnetostrictive, magneto and magnetostrictive are the same thing, Mm -hmm. Um, and piezo or piezoelectric. They're both ultrasonic, meaning they're both operating in between 18,000 cycles per second up to about 42,000 cycles per second. So there's a range within there, but both are ultrasonic. Here's an interesting thing, though, in the application. The higher the frequency, the smaller the surface area on the ultrasonic insert or tip when it's active. So what that means is as clinicians, you need to be mindful of that physics so that when you apply it to the tooth surface, you're using the lower two millimeters of that ultrasonic tip or insert against the tooth surface, keeping in mind the higher the frequency. And sometimes people think, oh, I'm going to go warp speed, nuclear waste, kind of like, you know, super duper duper fast kind of thing. Students love this. (laughs) Yeah. So, and then also manufacturers reps will say, oh, my unit uh, operates at 42,000 cycles per second. Okay, and that's great, but just realize the application that the that the higher the frequency, then the smaller the actual surface area that you have to work with. So with Magneto, it's driven by stacks and that produces an elliptical motion. I did want to clarify one thing that I've heard some speakers and other authors miss understand a particular area in this elliptical motion thing. And they've reported that there's a figure eight with magnetostrictive. And that was really an anomaly in that when that research was done, it was done with not using any water whatsoever and then observing using a video microscope the pattern that was created. When you don't use water, it is possible to get a figure eight movement of the tip. However, in a clinical situation, you would never, ever not use water. So you're not going to have a figure eight in a clinical situation. So when I, when I see articles or I hear speakers talk about magneto and, and it creates a figure eight motion, perhaps it does in a laboratory setting with no water, but it's never going to do that in a clinical situation. So what does it do? So it'll create an elliptical motion. So the elongation... Like an oval kind of... Yeah, or or a flatter oval type of shape. So in that ellipsis, that elliptical motion, sometimes it can be kind of like a squished flat oval or a more rounded oval depending on the tip that is actually used. But that magneto uh, stack with the elongation and contraction will create this elliptical motion as compared to the piezoelectric has crystals in the handpiece and that's where it will create linear motion. So a lot of times when clinicians, they may not have a choice of which technology is in a particular office and perhaps educationally didn't have that opportunity. I know that we've shared some stories that you said when you first encountered PAs, I was like, whoa, what is this? Uh, yes. And and some clinicians are like, oh, it's ultrasonics. It's just the same as what I learned in school. And perhaps that may have been with a Cavitron. So the good news is that 
most of what you need to know about using piezo you already know which is really kind of cool because you're using the lateral surfaces so if you know how to use a columbia 1314 barnhard 56 any universal curette it's exactly the same as, as using those lateral surfaces so that is you know really awesome that we have that available to us and we've all we've already mastered that to your point like like you mentioned like we have shared stories and I think how you're explaining it was where it clicked in my head as far as like if you have that Columbia or even a Gracie, I was thinking of like, that's the position. I struggled with going from magnetostrictive to piezo. Now I love piezo. I, I, I love both of them. I find, I, I mean, I just love all of them, but my gosh, I was a mess. An absolute man. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad that you raised that point because it's different from a Gracie and that a Gracie, we only use one side of the blade. And unless you're using something like a synthetic or, or a double Gracie um, that's now available, I love those, but that's a whole other I story. <laughs> but, uh, but so the piezoelectric is used more like a, a universal curette with where you have both lateral sides um, have blades on them. But here's the difference. And I think what you're saying where it was still a struggle point is that the degree of angulation against the tooth that's what's different and so with and we don't even realize we do this i mean it's just so automatic but with magneto we lean it against the tooth at about a 15 degree angle whereas with piezo it needs to be more a zero to five degree tilt off the tooth once you get those two things as far as saying okay i'm using the lateral surfaces and my tilt on the tooth is different then you're off to the races and ready to go but both technologies are very effective in clinical outcomes. And so it's a matter of using what is available uh, to you. Now, related to aerosol generation, both technologies require water. And while piezo requires less water to cool the crystals than the magneto stacks, water is still required. But listen to this really interesting research that um, came out of aerosol studies that, um, and this is a classic study, the um, Harold and Mol Molinari study from in JADA from 2004. In that, and everybody cites that when, when we start talking about aerosols. Well, one of their references in that study was from 1969, and Nisik and others were talking about aerosol generation in 1969. Harold also referenced his earlier work from 1999 in Jay Perio, and to quote this, it said, it said that showed when an ultrasonic scaler is used in vitro without any coolant water, there still was large amount of aerosol and splatter formed from small particles of liquid placed at the operative site to simulate blood and saliva. So even without having any water flow, just a few drops of water in the site around the site generated aerosols. So aerosols are a part of this choice of using ultrasonics. So it's not a matter of then saying, well, am I going to use, you know, a drop or a bucket full of water? You know, what's what's happening? But there are things that we can do to change the um, the circumstances, so to speak. And so it really does go back to your knowledge, your skill, and your judgment about whether you should or should not use ultrasonic therapy. And it's proven therapy, but you do need to think it through for that particular patient's condition their diagnosis and whether it's um, an instrument that is appropriate in that particular situation. So I wanted to share with you, and this term was coined by uh, in the Harold study, the classic one. Uh, and so in the term using a multi-layer approach. So let's say patient has a diagnosis, you've determined, yes, I do want to use ultrasonic therapy. I have the equipment that I know that I you know, what's in my particular practice here. So what I'm advocating in this multi-layer approach, somewhat different from what he did, because I added an additional step here, is to have a pre-appointment prep. So what I mean by that, and we're seeing a lot, of, especially with the COVID environment, about touch points and communication with patients and staying in contact with them. And so in this pre-appointment prep would be a communication that would go to go out to your patient before their scheduled appointment, and the emphasis is in showing them how much we care about their health and setting the stage for increased emphasis of self-care. So what I'm really excited about with different manufacturers, so like Colgate has a program that's uh, their professional direct program, where products are shipped directly to the patient's door, which is so cool that to be able to do that and to have them. So you combine that with your communication to say, let's get ready for your appointment. 
and this is this is what you can do and these are the products and then uh crest and oral b they've created the professional gingivitis kit so maybe that's something that could be a pre-appointment um, prep or you could customize a kit based on your professional recommendations specifically for that patient so our and there's a company sorry to sorry to oh, interrupt no. yeah. you but there's a company that's uh, about to launch that is going to do something like that a uh, kind of a curated product subscription program so that you could send it to the patient and i know tepe was trying to get that completed as well because you're i think you're on to a very important part of the program and it starts before they even enter our office that's so exciting to hear i mean i think that will be a game changer because then patients while they may still have some degree of disease at least get, let them get prepped before they even come in and in some ways maybe our patients are going to be getting healthier I mean, that, that that would just be absolutely awesome. Absolutely. Well, there's a, a periodontist in Boston area, just outside of Boston that I know. Um, and he put all of his patients through a boot camp, an oral hygiene boot camp. And you did not move into surgery. You did not move into SRP until you could show you maintained the biofilm at home. And if you came back in a week or two weeks later and you still weren't doing it, you just still, you did not pass go. You did not collect your $200. Like you did it again. You sat in the chair for another set of oral, oral hygiene instructions. You, you know, you performed it while me, maybe the hygienist was like confirming that it works. I think this is also something we could do for teledentistry. You know, like you could do a teledent uh, appointment where you can observe. They don't even have to take your chair time and mm -hmm. come into the office. And I think also this is a great place for maybe perio trays or something like that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's so exciting. And, and I think we're changing the trajectory of how we practice. And in that, changing the clinical outcomes for the patient, because that, that's really what it's about. It's not the, the checklist or the check, not checklist, but the check mark in the appointment book of, you know, done, 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 but really having an impact on health and helping patients get out of a cytokine storm that's occurring, you know, right, literally right behind their lips. So this, the second part of this layered approach then really has to do with the appropriate level of PPE. And again, looking at what products are coming out on, in the marketplace to address that. And I'm really excited. And I know that you've got some knowledge about this product called Clara, um, the Clara mask, and that's from Armor Dental. And what's exciting about this is that it's a reusable passive air clear mask and it functions as a respirator. It has two different models, either one for inhalation of air or or the other one with, with two ports, inhalation and exhalation, with uh, HEPA filter ports on them. And the great thing about this is that it decreases all of the uh, disposable waste from all of the PPE we're using because it's a sustainable product that's used over again, disinfectable, and also that it has a voice port in it so that people can only see you talking, but they can hear you speaking as well. So, you know, looking at that appropriate level of PPE for the services that you're providing as defined by the CDC and OSHA will be very important. But again, I'm uh, congratulations to companies that are forward thinking and trying to create products for us to keep us safe and to keep our patients safe. It is about time we needed these things we we have and and that then we you know when we take a look at other things that are available the pre-procedural rinses would be the third step in this layering approach and in that part you know we had um you know the ada website show that pre-procedural uh, rinses were advocated and they named specific types of pre-procedural rinses and then it was off the website and then now we're hearing more in the literature but there are great products that are out there such as molecular iodine from io technologies or chlorine dioxide with closest or aura care or commercially available hydrogen peroxide uh, such as colgate's peroxyl or oral b has, has mouth sore so you know it's just the products are available for us to be able to use Use those to decrease that bacterial and viral load and the research seems to be supportive of these products so I think that would be another thing now an interesting piece of research that just came out within the last couple months related to using a dual HVE uh, reducing the aerosol burden that is in the air now I know you and I've discussed about in the past, we were big on, oh, I'll just use a saliva ejector. And but the saliva ejector is just for pulled fluids. And, you know, when I read this research, I kind of got a little embarrassed to think that this research by Vena was from 1993 in the Journal of Infection and Public Health. 
you know, he stated that it's not very efficient tool for reducing the aerosol cloud. It was used, the saliva ejector should be thought of as for pulled water. So that the aerosol cloud in that particular research using just the saliva ejector was um, 30 minutes in the operatory. And that for the HVE, it should remove up to 100 cubic feet per of air per minute. So the small opening of the saliva ejector just doesn't remove enough large enough volume of air to be classified as, as HVE. That was further supported by Harold in the classic JADA study in 2004. So what the Medical University of South Carolina Dental School and their research was just published recently in Quintessence International um, in August of 2020, and they showed that using two HVE devices were best at reducing aerosols. And the way that they did that from a practical standpoint is they installed a T-junction in the HVE line. So again, this is all part of the layering approach. And then, you know, there, of course, someone will have objections to say, well, yeah, but this is heavy. Well, you know, get a cordy so that you have you know, attach it to your hand your wrist so that you don't have that that fatigue or and this is something that is um, i know being spoken about on social media quite a bit is that in your morning huddle identify those times where you anticipate the need for hv and schedule a time with a dental assistant yep get that four-handed dentistry yeah right and you know there's such been such an influx of external aerosol capture devices but i would say for our audience that to do thorough research on these products and they're not to replace that intraoral part of the hve you want to want to capture those aerosols as close to the source as possible yeah and that's actually something that i've been doing for a minute is and i i'm mr thirsty or something like uh, um a Zyrus Isolite. For me, I had two HVEs in my first one, the one, the outreach that I've been at for a while. That was so fantastic because I did that dual HVE. And actually you can, uh, just a call back to our Instagram TV or our website or our YouTube channel, you can go see my high volume evacuation, like evaluations that I did. Excellent. Love it. There's Love three it. parts to that. So y'all can go look and see it. That is fantastic. So here's something that was rather interesting recently um, about, you know, imagine that there were no aerosols produced at all. You know, how could that be? So investigators from the University of Illinois, Chicago, again, in August of 2020, they published an online article in the Physics of Fluids, and they were adding an FDA approved high molecular weight polymer. So it's a polyacrylic acid in water to create viscoelastic forces preventing droplet formation. Well, isn't that a mouthful of gobbledygook? <laughs> yeah. But basically, they made the water stretchy is what they did. So instead of aerosolizing it, it made it stretchy. And by making it stretchy, it didn't create the aerosols. Well, that's a thought. Isn't that incredible? So while, and, and they actually went ahead and they have a provisional patent, uh, on this. And while the research looks promising on this, that there still needs to be more research related to the biofilm matrix and what it does to that biofilm matrix and being able to create shear force to dismantle the biofilm, as well as what that material, the liquid actually does to the piezo crystals or the magneto stacks and how they behave long term. So we go from, okay, we're going to cover ourselves up with all kinds of personal protective equipment and we're going to have the patient do pre-procedural -pre rinsing and all that kind of stuff. But looking at research that's really out of the box of let's change the stretchiness of water and maybe that will be something that will will help us. And so and that's a piece of research that I'm in that their body of knowledge, something that I will certainly be following very closely. But isn't that cool? I know that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So when we get down to then the actual technique with ultrasonics, it's, so first of all, you have to make a decision. Are you going to use it or not use it? And what's the patient's diagnosis and, diagnosis and is it appropriate? So the next part is then using serviceable ultrasonic inserts and tips. And by serviceable, serviceable, I mean ones that aren't worn. So all the way back in 2006, Leah and his colleagues in the Journal of Clinical Perio, they show that if a tip was worn two millimeters or more, it was 50% less efficient in cleaning because it decreased the amplitude. So a medical provider is not going to do a procedure with instruments that are worn. You wouldn't let them do that. So that requires that about a monthly basis that we collect all of the inserts and tips and we inspect them and we measure them. And for your magneto tips, you absolutely must look at the stacks. If the stacks are bent, 
even if it's a brand new tip, it's not going to transmit the energy and it's not going to clean efficiently. And if you're using worn tips, and this is going to be a very bold statement for me to make, but using worn ultrasonic inserts and tips is akin to fraud. Neglect. I think it's supervised neglect. I have to agree with you. Yeah. I mean, let's be bold because this is how we make changes, right? But we got to call it what it is. In the world of medical, like you just said, what else are we doing that's not efficient? Would we let like needles go into our arms to draw blood out that wasn't like, I just don't understand. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And what happens is that when you use worn inserts and tips, it will burnish the calculus. So now, and then that, boy, oh, trying to remove burnished calculus, I think is one of the toughest clinical procedures for us to do. And then trying to even detect the burnished calculus, that's a whole nother, that, that's a whole nother episode. So, right. um, but, um, so when we're actually using our technique, in adjusting the power, we're going to power down. Remember, the power adjusts the amplitude. So if I don't have as much whipping back and forth, I'm not going to create the volume or the spray of the aerosol. So just because a manufacturer says that a tip can be used on high power doesn't mean it has to be used on high power. It just means that that's the maximum it should be used on. So you can always turn the power down. So when you do that, that means that your technique, you must stay in contact with, let's say, the, the deposit that's there because then it will, the energy is captured and it will then fracture the calculus. If you're on again, off again, then, you know, not touching it, you're not going to get that energy building up in order to fracture the calculus. So it is a difference in technique. You're not going fast. You're going low, meaning low, lower power and slow, being very methodical, going over every root surface as if you're coloring in the entire surface. So using this methodical approach, it takes time. And it should not be rushed. It takes expertise in knowing the root anatomy. So it's a matter of then using a layered approach, but then changing our technique so that we're going low and slow. And it will take a little bit longer to do. The thing we don't want to do is press hard. When you use more pinch force and when you press harder, you're actually dampening the amplitude of the instrument. And you don't want to do that. So, you know, light, light grasp, like a probe, about 20 grams of pressure that you're pressing against the tooth, but staying in contact, going low and slow. So it really is a combination of using your professional knowledge, your skill with going low and slow, and then your judgment of when to use, whether to use ultrasonics, or perhaps you say, you know what, no, for this patient, this is not the best thing to do, but that is something that is part of your professional judgment. Man, I this is all so great. Because one of the things that I needed a reminder of is that slow and and low because I and your patients will appreciate when you put that thing on low. I'm going to tell you right now, my students always do this where they like jack up the power. Right. And yeah. then the patient, I walk over and they're like, oh, the patient's just so sensitive. And I was like, well, <laughs> yeah, I bet they are. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. I was like, so we turn it down and then the patient's like, oh yeah, that's not so bad. I'm like, see, you literally were trying to jackhammer their tooth. Like, let's not do that. Let's do this mm -hmm. like calmer way. But I personally sometimes need to remember that as well and how that stroke um, is more continuous versus me like touch and it shatter and move on to the next deposit. Don't you get a serotonin rush when a piece of calculus pops off? Oh, it's like crack in my veins or <laughs> like it's, it's a... yeah. I don't know if crack goes in your veins. I don't actually really know, but yeah, like, yeah, it's a either. high like no other. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, but I think we, it, it requires that we learn to be patient with it. But the big caveat here is that if you're using worn inserts or tips, don't expect it to work. It will not. It just can't do the job. So, you know, working with your manufacturing reps, I mean, a lot of them have special, and, and the other thing that you do is like having a, having a measure party. If, if you don't have the time to do it, invite your rep in and say, hey, could you gather all my inserts and my, or my tips and measure them for me? And in that trusting relationship, have them go through and say, yep, these are the ones that are okay. These are the ones that aren't. This is what I have for special. This is what I can do for you. But I think so many times that we're using equipment that is just not serviceable anymore. So it makes it, it makes it exciting that through this whole pandemic and the, the times that we're in that we can pause and say, all right, maybe it's time to do things a little bit differently. More efficiently and effective. Like we were just like chasing our tails 
like, and yeah, we needed, we needed this pause and to rethink. And if I could just build on the conversation of tips and get your thoughts on this, because one of the things that in school, I learned what magnetostrictive, I really started to learn my tips. Marianne Dreyer was so kind after many, many years of me being in perio and using right lefts, showed me how to actually use them properly. Mm -hmm. I was definitely using them wrong. Um, You know, I've learned about the triple bin. And then as I migrated over to piezo, the conversation when I have like on social media or in the world, if I ever go back into the world again, (laughs) when we're at these conferences, um, the conversation I would have is like, I love my piezo now. I mean, I love them both, but I really, I I appreciate it for what it is now. And one of the things that I had to not only get past was the, of course, the technique that we just discussed, but my tips, because a lot of piezo tips that I see when I go into these offices are like these giant beaver style tips or these extremely fat and large and people not knowing how to use those tips with the right settings. And so it wasn't effective. It wasn't efficient. The patients were annoyed by it. It was like very messy. Can you speak a little bit to the tips if I didn't sure. partic- particularly, you know, say something correct on the, on the- No, you, you said a lot of things that were correct. And here's the great news is that, again, back to manufacturer innovations, is that when you look at the piezo tips and kind of, I, I think of it as the menu that's available, and you know that I um, formerly worked for Acteon. I mean, we had over 80 tips, 80 different tips. So, you know, are, am I going to use all 80 tips? Probably not. But there were a variety of shapes and geometries of tips that were available. So I think that, you know, with your experience in that one particular office, and that's why we have to have, I would say, really form great relationships with our manufacturer reps so that they can tell us about products that are available to us and to, and things that we could consider and to do a match for match to say, okay, in the magneto side, this is this is what is offered on the piezo side. Or maybe it's something that's like totally different than the magneto side and a different tip that you've not used before. I know we, we tend to we tend to always use whatever we learned in school, which that's a great foundation. That's a great start, but I would say it's just it is only that. It is just a start. So I would say for that particular office, they just weren't aware of um, the number of different tips that are available in piezo. And also you can't use the same setting in all your tips. No, but that's true too for Magneto. I mean, the Magneto tips have their... Yeah, both sides. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so it's it's a matter of start out with what does the manufacturer recommend? Because those tips are designed specifically, you know, the metal, the connecting body, the, the entire, you know, I would say the engineering design of it is all designed to be used at a particular maximum power and then whatever that is. So if they tell you to use it on low, don't exceed that because there's a reason for that, that if you use it higher than that maximum of low setting, the risk is fracturing the tip. It only has to happen to you once as a clinician to have a fracture tip inside someone's mouth and say, oh, please, I hope you didn't go into the lung or hope or or worse yet, I hope you didn't go through the stomach and out the other end kind of situation. If, if that's what the manufacturer instructions tell you, then follow those. However, if they say that you can go to high, yes, you can, but you can always go lower, which that's the sweet spot now with decreasing our aerosol generation. You know, this is just another great example of really appreciating our technology and the science and the engineering and innovation that goes behind it. And, you know, sometimes we get very, um, you know, we just, it's, we, we turn it on and we start using it. And I say this yes. for our like high volume, our, our vacuum, our suction units, our vacuums, you know, not just thinking about like what goes on the tip, but what's happening in that closet back in the back, making all that noise when you flip the switch on, you know, there's a lot of, we get so used to like walking in the door and flipping on our compressor, our air, our water and going, oh, well, it's working and not thinking about all the little details that we need to do to maintain it and appreciate what's happening in the technology itself. And I would say the same for our uh, ultrasonic units, like, you know, appreciate that people put a lot of thought and effort into making you more efficient, but, you know, I'm not going to ask my Kia to go Ferrari speeds, right? Like we have to like, appreciate what we have and be very kind to it and not work harder at the end of the day. 
No, I mean, there's there's so much going on for us just physically, emotionally, just breathing. I mean, you know, that we really need to um, have a, a kind of a sigh of relief that, yes, we can do this. We have uh, really great equipment to be able to, to do it. Uh, you know, Magneto and Piezo are both excellent choices. And uh, again, going back to that knowledge, skill and judgment of when I'm going to do what for my, my patients. Awesome. This has been fantastic. Any other little tidbits, points that I we didn't d discuss? Well, you know I'm a geek about ultrasonics. And so if people want to contact me, that can be reached at noel at ultrasonicsplus.com. And my purpose in starting this company is to create clarity, confidence, and clinical excellence. And so when it does uh, come to situations where people want to up their game on using ultrasonic therapy, regardless of the technology, whether it's Magneto or Piezo, um, I'm here to help you. We can do virtual trainings, um, especially related to those uh, patients that you have that are more involved in using left and rights and uh, being able to, some. I've got some really great shortcuts on how to use left and rights and would love to share that information with uh, with your audiences as well. Awesome. Well, I appreciate all the information. I appreciate all that you're doing to make us uh, better, more efficient clinicians. And really, like you said, clear, we need clarity. And, you know, I, I loved my instructors. I thought I've got a wonderful hygiene education, but, you know, that was also almost 20 years ago. And I think refreshers on Cavitrons and Magnetos and Piazons and all, all of that jazz, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. God, we need it. We need it so badly because there's the little details where I'm like, oh, turn it down, Michelle, slow it down. <laughs> <laughs> check your tips <laughs> all that stuff. well if that's if that's the one parting com comment i would say yeah check your tips please check, check your, your tips. tips yeah sorry right. well this was right. a fabulous thank you so much for your time oh my pleasure it's been fun i always love speaking with you i feel like there's this like combustible mind thing that happens and uh, i absolutely love it so thank you so much Oh, that's so fantastic. And definitely everybody check out um, Noelle's work, any of her resources. If you see her name up, pop up on an article or webinar, be sure to dive in or take it. You won't regret it, I promise. And thank you again, Noelle. Uh, best of luck with Ultrasonics Plus and thank you for all you do for us. Oh, thanks, Michelle. I think that we really wrapped it up beautifully. Noelle did a great job. And so reach out if you have any questions and definitely take one of her courses if you are ever able to you won't regret it any thoughts as we close up andrew no i'm really looking forward to hearing everyone's thoughts though about what they want to listen to coming up so please 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 we can't say it enough let us know what you are wanting to hear yeah and send us your feedback and share this with all of your colleagues um we love how we grow and that has been for the most part always organically um people sharing things people learning a new little tidbit and spreading the word and we really appreciate that because our guests are so fantastic that they deserve to have their message out in the world out in the world i should say so share it with your colleagues that'd be fantastic and if you haven't already subscribed to our newsletter, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And if you have any questions at all, you can email us individually, Michelle at a tale of two hygienists with an S.com and Andrew at a tale of two hygienists.com. And thank you to PDT for supporting the CE portion of this episode. Because y'all, you get CE. If you go um, click the link in the show notes, that will take you over to CE Zoom to take a quiz that will give you a CE credit, self-study CE credit. And we appreciate PDT and their amazing people and their amazing instruments for sponsoring that. So go check out pdtdental.com and tell them that you appreciate the free CE. All right, anything else? Good. All right, y'all have a great week. Bye, everybody. Bye, y'all.